Thank you, everyone. Um, everyone stays awake after lunch. I think history is intrinsically interesting. History obviously started right at the beginning. We all made the image of God, and I suppose we're now medical images with making the image. John Eliotson was born in 1791, qualified and went to the South St. Thomas's Hospital, was then appointed as the first professor of medicine to University College Hospital, it's my own medical school, which I went to in 1972, which was the year the CT scanner was announced. What is obviously something important retrospectively is not obviously prospectively, so looking at something from into the future, there may be something which is important, which actually in reality does go nowhere. Unfortunately, Ellison got very involved in mesmerism and animal magnetism. He met Baron Dubote and got involved in putting people in mesmeric trances. If you go along the road here to Warren Street, go south, that's Tottenham Court Road, and obviously University College Hospital is close to that. There were two sisters called the Oakey Sisters. They were admitted to his hospital fits. He found he put them into mesmeric trances. When they were in mesmeric trance, they could look into their own bodies and see inside their own bodies. When they were in deeper trances, they could look inside other people's bodies. So you could do a ward round, take the sisters around him, they could look inside his patients and the We laugh now, but at the time they were thinking that was that, that was that was so serious. As you might imagine after a while and we, he was removed from the staff of University <laughs> Hospital. A lot of interest, he founded a magazine called The Zoist, and at the time this was, a, this was an important topic. Perkins Tractors. And it's still, it's still quite serious that people wear copper bra bracelets for, um, for, for, for rheumatism. Anyway, he was one of the first people who was doing clinical pathological correlation, the same that Sir William Moser did. In other words, he was seeing patients when they're alive, doing post-mortem, and looking inside them after death to correlate clinical findings, physical findings, and post-mortem findings. And in his textbook, The um, Principles and Practice of Medicine, the same top topic as those, was a great book. Aneurysms, the aorta, frequently exist without people being aware of it. They will fall down dead in a moment as if they were shot. Um, as the 19th century progressed, medicine was improving, pathology, uh, microbiology, histopathology, but as far as imaging or looking inside the body, it was really as far as a finger could reach or far as simple endoscopy went. And obviously endoscopy is older than radiology. All was changed with Wilhelm Röntgen made, made his discovery by the Nobel Laureate in 1901 for his, his discovery of x-rays. The original x-rays were really quite primitive. Um, tremendous excitement. This is the first annual conference of the British Institute of Radiology in 1897 at St. Martin's Town Hall, looking very much like a modern conference with social program and lectures and technical exhibition. By 1906, better X-ray equipment was available plus fluoroscopy. This is Walsham and Orton writing in 1906, the first book in English dedicated to chest radiology. In the diagnosis of thoracic aneurysm, the x-rays reach from the most successful practical applications. Diagnosis by the ordinary methods is in many cases extremely difficult. With the aid of the Rankin race, however, satisfactory conclusion can as all be arrived at. So this is the radiograph from their book showing a thoracic aneurysm diagnosed by a plain film and also by fluoroscopy seeing, seeing pulsating. And obviously it's only by diagnosing anti-mortem you can then look at actually trying to treat it anti-mortem. Neuroradiology, which is obviously the topic of the session after this, was more difficult, and in early days the only real use of X-rays was really to locate foreign bodies or to look at fractures. Gloucester Forstel, the great Swedish pathologist, radiologist, worked with the pathologist um, Henschen, and actually he'd shown that he, the pathologist showed some widening of the internal auditory canal with acoustic neuroma, and this is 1911. So this is really, really very early. Really quite sophisticated, plain film radiology, the sort of stuff I grew up with in the early 1980s doing, doing radiology, and I was taught all these plain film views. This is 1911, showing widening of the, on the, on the right side there, widening of the um, internal auditory canal with an acoustic neuroma shown on a plain film. Arthur Schiller was the fa father of neuroradiology. His textbook came out in 1912, and again, plain film findings. 
and again, quite sophisticated films. So this is 1918, Maturity Radiology. Um, again, the apparatus is covered, it's surrounded, it's protected from radiation, but it's not, not electrically protected, so if you touch that, you would be the end of you, but nice, nice plain films. <laughs> this, is, this is Skull Radio with the Hamster Hospital in 1930. And again, it's of SMV view. And again, as you can see, the, the tube is protected from, protected from radiation, but obviously there's, there, there's cables coming in if you'd actually touch that. And there are actually accounts of a, radio, of a nurse being electrocuted in Wimbledon Hospital in the 1930s, just shown the BJR, because she touched the x ray machine as a radio and made an exposure on a ward mobile, and the nurse didn't survive. Complicated plane film views, so which all, we all grew up with. Eric Lyson was the major pioneer looking inside the brain, or well, one of the ones, um, <coughs> with different views. He died at a young age. He worked with a chap called Shananda, and they made this bit of apparatus, the old, the old um, skull table. I think older members of the audience, Stephen, there is nodding away. But we had these skull, these skull, these skull units, and all, they all disappeared now. But again, complicated, and obviously, Ray Yorker is highly skilled in complex views to show this. This is the uh, precision radiography with the x-ray machine moving around the patient. There's the apparatus as it developed. As far as special examination is concerned, you then have ventriculography showing the ventricles, encephalography, myelography, angiography, either by cut down, direct puncture, or by catheter, and radionuclide brain scanning. Walter Dandy was a protege of the great neurosurgeon Harley Cushing and John Hopkins. In 1918, he ventriculography, 1919, encephalography by injecting air via the lumbar theca. The possibility of filling the cerebral ventricles with a medium that will produce a shadow on the rotgenogram. An accurate outline of the cerebral ventricles could be photographed with rotgen rays. Neoplasms directly or indirectly modify the size or shape of the ventricles. We should then possess an early and accurate aid to the localization of cranial infections. Then along come house seal. Totally unpredictable discovery. Quite unpredictable or unsuspected by the radial, radial community. Um, and again, not necessarily grasped with enthusiasm initially. At that time, the radiologist wanted to get more and more detail, more and more resolution, better, better, better resolution, you'll get, you'll get better results. Hounds have produced a technique which was low on spatial resolution, high in contrast, counterintuitive to contemporary radiology. The initial work on perspex models, go on below is the first ever CT that Houndsfield did. There's the lathe bed which he then did his original laboratory work on. And here it is on the, uh, the first floor of the institute. And again, it's basically a, a source, initial source of, iron, of, of radiation, a detector. Moving, moving it around and actually taking images of the process of, re of, of reconstruction. And again, the early images looked very primitive, almost as bad as, a, a, as early MRI, but there was, there was a huge promise there, and I recognized that. That's the first brain scan on this pickle bit of brain. There's Hounsfield's original proposal. What you're showing there is obviously that our conventional radiographs, you reduce a three-dimensional structure into two-dimension. In house of shows there, particularly on that right image there, you're, you're actually putting it back into, into two-dimensional, so actually there's not everything over, overlapping. That's Hansel's original proposal. And again, how the original CT scanner worked with the scan that makes a translation and rotation going slowly through. So the early CT scans were very slow. There's James Ambrose. Who was the pioneer at the, um, the pioneer of, of self head CT? He was at Atkinson Morley Hospital. He was very interested in techniques of neuroradiology other than the traditional encephalography and myelography, as was the whole unit. He published and he actually wrote about using ultrasound in the head to try and look for midline shift. He also did a lot of work on, on, uh, on um, nuclear medicine brain scans. The problem with nuclear medicine brain scans was a false negative rate of about 30 to 30%. They were, but there was, there was little else. I want to thank so fascinating about this whole history of CT Hounds, who went straight from that late bed to that in one jump, which is almost unbelievable. And he thought it would work. A very primitive late bed, that was the first scanner in one jump, which I think must be astonishing. 
that actually is now in the science museum, so don't do, do, do actually go and visit it. So the first clinical head machine. There's house shield. I think with a dental chair on the left attached to it. And that was all home, home made with, 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 with stuff that was actually very readily available. None, none of this was made for the scan. It was all actually bits and pieces which were, which were, which were readily available off the shelf. And there's the first patient scan. We've actually got that Polaroid. And the, there was no seat, there was no computer attached to the scanner. It was taken, the scan was made, it was all taken on, on, on tape, taken to EMI, came back the next day. When that first image was shown, which was a tumor in the, in the, left, frontal, in the left frontal lobe, uh, it was said that Hansfield and Ambrose danced around like two footballers who'd scored the winning goal. And here we're showing pathology directly rather than traditional technique, which shows indirectly. So it's, it's a different way of looking at things. I was sent this yesterday, in fact. This is uh, Dr. Perry's blog book uh, from 1972 at Atkinson Morley Hospital, Curtis and George's Healthcare. And obviously, there's a significant physics component to all of this, so thank, thank you for that. And again, the 1010 scan. This is what I went and saw as a medical student in Queen's Square, must have been 1976, and I saw that. And a huge, a huge excitement. The 1970 is in some respects the golden age for radiology of all these new techniques coming in. There's a 1010 brochure on the left, which I've got Hansfield to sign for me. Remarkable man, do read the biography. I'm not just saying that, he's a thoroughly interesting man, so do read the biography. And again, James Bull, who was the, um, worked at Queen Square and at East St George's, so was involved in EMR quite early on, that until his discovery, X-ray photography has not advanced fundamentally since Rundle and X-ray his wife hands in Birdsburg in 1895. <coughs> Certainly not involved in terms of obviously started, this is the start of the digital the di digital revolution. Transformed investigative medicine. Huge excitement. A lot of milestones started in 67, and as you can see there, various tests in the late, the late 1960s. September 71 to Atkinson Morley, first patient scan, October 71, 1st of October, and now it's 20 April 1972 in the USA. And then gradual introduction. The first body scan, the 1973, was Tony Williams, who was a very thin engineer who fit inside the head scanner before they made the body scanner. <coughs> What's interesting that this whole acceptance, you know, sometimes in, in the UK we, we had a fairly naive approach. This is wonderful, this is fantastic. An editorial BMJ 1975. The benefits of the scanner were so overwhelming as to be obvious. But what were they? You know, it's. it's it's how something is used or what they're actually doing. No need for a randomized controlled trial to make sure we could believe what we were seeing. In America, they're rather more cautious about it. Uh, Feinberg in 1978 was saying one center there was no change in morbidity and mortality, there were fewer invasive tests, and the total cost for diagnosis increased. Which is sort of interesting. Atkinson Morley, Ambrose writing in 1976 of paper on head injuries. He was saying that it replaced angiography, <coughs> reduced burr holes, but mortality wasn't reduced. This was writing in 1976. The group in Glasgow in 1978, they said the CT often revealed clinically unsuspected hematomata, but they were still using the traditional techniques for transfer to a specialist center. In other words, you have to demonstrate clinical deterioration in your patient, and then you transfer your patient to the specialist center. And with obviously with that, what means of doing things, mortality was identical whether you had the CT scanner or not. They changed their referral guidelines in 1978. So in Glasgow, after their policy change, in terms of getting more referrals, their numbers of referrals for head injuries doubled. They were looking in 1978 at the cost-effectiveness of CT scanning, and this is an interesting comment here that was made. Technology may not improve patient outcome unless steps are taken to ensure that the right patients have access to the technology at the right time. In other words, having high technology in super specialist centres without access to the bulk of the population may make very little difference to overall population mortality. So, the conclusion 1978, uh, with Bartlett, Neil Dwyer, and Benham right, were saying some neurosurgeons advising that scanners should be placed in district hospitals to avoid transfer to regional units. Which in fact is exactly what happened. So CT scanner, instead of being a highly specialist with a kit in a neurosciences centre, 
actually has devolved throughout the NHS more generally. This is the body machine. I love that picture there, it's in, it's in the book, but it's almost looks like the Leonardo drawings, doesn't it, of the early body scanner. This is the production model body machine. Body scanner is quite slow, there's a young lady from the day you know there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a team, Hounsfield made a bachelor throughout his, throughout his life. And this was Hounsfield's own abdomen in the CT, the first international conference on CT in 1975, and that caused an absolute sensation. The first machine went, body machine went to Norfolk Park Hospital. And I think what a pay tribute to the work of Dr. Louis Creel, who I think is probably not recognised as much as he should have been, but made a massive contribution to early body CT, particularly to pleural disease and asbestos related disease and abdominal pathology. And that's him with Barbara Carson and Godfrey Hounsfield so looking at the body scanner. Development of the plot of, of, of conventional CT. And the problem is conventional CT could only go so far. And with MRI coming up, conventional CT was looking really, came to look really well by the tired. 770 scanner, a model, a model of. And again, increasing sophistication of conventional CT. But we sort of started to look, it became rather tired as MRI was developing. Topaz scan, which Liz Beckham might want to talk a little bit about in her presentation, is sort of maybe about prefigure, prefiguring of the of, of spiral scanning. And again, the EMI got a lot of difficulty, exceptionally difficult in the year 1979. And as you see from the top, top, um, top left, the top, top, top right there, many electronics was actually contributing very little to the overall finance of of, of um, of EMI, as you may make your loss, and obviously the history of EMI is a sadly sad one. 1970, getting scanners in hospital, we had our own CAT scanner appealing in Bromley. Bromley CAT scanner appeal, no you, this is being funded by a public subscription. And the problem with these scanner appeals was that it was often only funded the machine, there were issues with staffing and running costs, issues with machine replacement, but it gave people a local sense of ownership. So the voluntary hospital movement actually, people raised money for in hospital with state funded care, it's funded state care to the community and often a sense of local disengagement. And there's Willie Callan, who is at the moment he's actually up shopping with his wife, I was having a lunch time and he's shopping and he's talking to my he's slightly like younger there with them, um, not quite so grey hair, but again, he in 1990 he described spiral CT Volumetric CT, which really transformed CT and re issued in the modern modern CT scanning. And again, we have this sort of image here, which I, again, I think Elliot Sim would have been fascinated by, and Walsh and Orton, and all the great people in chest radiology. The anatomical images showing this, uh, rather like the ladies looking in from top and core into people's bodies. Current issues are really CT guided intervention, a relentless increase in demand of CT. A CT brain is now part of a confusion screen. So in other words, you, you, you can get, you get, in my department, you can get a CT scan faster than that abdominal ultrasound. Multi-investigation duplication, we see people requesting VQ scans and CT pulmonograms at the same time. But it's transformed things. Our traditional paradigm was traditional radiology was either minimally invasive or invasive diagnosis and invasive therapy. We now have minimally invasive therapy but you only have minimally invasive therapy on the basis of non-invasive diagnosis. And with an aging population, we can't, we can't do, you know, we've got to treat them gently, so it's non-invasive diagnosis we have to have. However, clear the streets. Superman's dexter is out of control. Is this what's happened to our departments now? That the new building apparatus were required is shown by the fact that already the staff has had to be increased. And even now, it takes the whole accommodation to get through the large number of cases attending for all kinds of medical and surgical work. Notwithstanding that the pavilion was made as large as the space at our disposal permitted, it is already evident that the demands upon it are far in excess of what can be accomplished. Two medical officers are daily engaged in the work, unqualified assistant, a staff of nurses, nursing women, nursing women, regular for a long time, 2,000 photographs, etc. At the present moment, the managers are engaged in a great scheme for rebuilding the whole hospital, and it is hoped when the time comes that still greater facility will be placed at the disposal of the staff. Meanwhile, the present building is serving as the purpose of showing the managers and the staff to some extent what is required. 
That was written by a previous president of the British Institute of Radiology. You'd always imagine Stephen writing that now, can't you, about, you know, there's too many, we only need a bigger department, etc. So who wrote that and when was it written? It was written by John McIntyre in 1903, about his new X-ray department being open in 1898, I think it was. So even by 1903, he was complaining about, about the workload. Nothing changes. Here is this very high-tech department. We look at it now and we smile. This was high technology radiology in, 19, in 1903. And this is from the BJL, the, or the earlier early version. High technology radiology. People 100 years now look back at us and say, you know, well, we know it's now very primitive, but we are midgets standing on the shoulder of giants, or we're isolated humans standing on the shoulder of humans. Gilbert Scott, who was, who was the um, honorary treasurer of the Institute, this is from Lord Nuts, he was at the Royal London Hospital. Dear Dr. Gilbert Scott, I very much regret that it is impossible for us to carry out your scheme for having a fully run primary department at the London. But for 7,000 owing to our bankers, we are quite able to embark on any capital expenditure in 1922. 1927, if you have an unanswerable case that matter makes it almost unbearable for me to have to say that I don't want to see that London can possibly do what it ought to do. The problem is happening as radiology always has been expensive, as the 20th century progressed, it became impossible to fund radiology on the basis of the voluntary or some movement. You can't finance high technology in modern medicine on the basis of, base of charity. This is the 1893 hospital Saturday, raising money, shaking money for the local hospital. So when the NHS came, it had to come in because basically the, the voluntary or some movement was, was collapsing. But what's happening now? You know, technological trends are appreciated, the practice of radiology. How do we fund radiology in the UK now? Can we fund our tax, taxes? What do people want to, you know, how can we fund at the current level, level of demand in our departments? It goes back to, to, um, um, uh, to, 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 to Glasgow in 1903. Can we provide a service that is high quality for everybody, immediately and cheap? Difficult. So what John Ellison on the right lines? Your eyes, shh, just relax. When Dr. Zager's eyes scanned the patient for clarity far exceeding the finest x-ray. And I think this is exactly what we're doing now with our modern MRI scans and ultrasound and CT. So I think John Ellison would be proud of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>